Oh, man, uh, that was great, wasn't it? Goodness gracious, Whew. we are so lucky to uh, have such a great team of people who lead us in worship each week. They're so good at what they do, man. Woof. Yeah. Um, if you have your Bible, let's open it up to Mark chapter 6, all right? We're in Mark chapter 6, making our way through. There's a lot to cover today. Uh, Bible journal, page 36, 38, and 40. Like I said, there's a lot to cover today. Uh, so we're, we're going to be on three different pages in the Bible journal today to tell you how big of a chunk of Scripture we're doing. Uh, and then in the blue Bible, it's page 817 and 818. Uh, if, you, uh, if you are reading from your Bible, uh, it's just uh, Mark 6. Verses 14 through 44. Uh, we're going to jump right in. Um, and so uh, just, you know, try and follow along as best as you can. Um, I'll be stopping throughout um, at different points. So uh, here we go. Mark chapter 6, starting verse 14. King Herod heard of it. It is Jesus and his disciples, in case you guys were wondering, doing all these crazy, amazing things, teaching and preaching, healing people, healing the sick, healing the demon-possessed. Uh, and so uh, Herod, uh, the king, had heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Uh, and so um, some said, uh, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he is Elijah, and others said he is a prophet, like the one, or like one of the prophets of old. We'll come back to uh, these descriptions as identifiers for Jesus later on in the book of Mark. Uh, we'll see these descriptors come up again, and so we'll we'll want to touch on that. But but just know, like Jesus has been in ministry for about a year, and he's already like one of the greatest of all time. Okay, it took like LeBron James ten years in the NBA to even get a like consideration that he might even be close to as good as Michael Jordan. It, it, like Jesus, it took one year, and he's like the greatest of all time already. Like he's right up there with the greats, uh, and so. Um, but when Herod heard it, he thought, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. So that's the first time we hear about John the Baptist since chapter 1. And it's kind of a shock to the system. If you're just a normal reader of Mark's gospel, you hear about John the Baptist chapter 1. And then you get to chapter 6 and you just hear, he's dead? Like, what happened? You know? And, uh, and so that's really what this is going to unpack, is what happened, how this happened, what took place. And, uh, and so we're going to read through this um, here. Verse 17. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. All right. Uh, so I love how Mark describes Herodias as his sister-in-law in whom he married, right? Like, like Mark is not mixing or mincing words. He's, he, is, he is there and he is saying, look, uh, so he did something wrong. <laughs> he married his sister-in-law, which he should not have done. And, uh, and John is declaring this and he's talking about this. Verse 18 says it plainly, for John had been saying to Herod, it is not law for, lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And so Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man. He kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. So there's this interesting thing happening here where King Herod uh, arrests John because Herodias is like, we can't let that guy, you know, be free. Uh, but like Herod starts hearing the message of John and he's kind of like, oh, hmm. He's perplexed a little bit. He's like, this is, this is good stuff. I really like this. And he hears John gladly and keeps him safe. It's, it's really strange when your, your wife wants to kill one of your best friends. Um, yeah, that, that seems to be what's happening here. Uh, like, like John and Herod have hit it off in some sort of way, even though John's pretty clear, like, hey, bro, you're living a life of sin. Uh, they're still good buddies, and, and, uh, and, and Herodias wants John dead. And so... Anyway, that's, it's, it's, it's a very interesting situation. Verse 21, But an opportunity came 
When Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. And when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out, and she said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths, his great, and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. And he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Now, there's a few things that I want to just touch on here. I know that this is more of just kind of a narrative and it's just kind of a story, and, uh, and, and I can't really give you a how to not behead a guy sermon today, okay? Um, <laughs> So, but I do think there are some things um, that we can pull out of this that I think are really good for us to pull out of it. Uh, one is uh, standing up for God and standing up for Jesus does not usually end well for people in the Bible. And, um, and so... I think, it's, I think it's important to note that when, uh, you know, what Jesus says is very true in, in the Beatitudes. When he says, blessed are you who are persecuted for my name's sake. Basically, blessed are you who stand up for me and live your life in a way that represents me well. Um, because it's not going to necessarily go well with you in our world because our world does not like that. And, um, and so, like, let's not walk through life thinking that Christianity is some sort of, like, like card to, like, a life of prosperity. It's not. It's actually probably closer resembles a journey toward us dying for something we believe in so strongly. And giving ourselves up for something far greater and more powerful than we are. Um, and so we just need to be careful that we don't mix like what we see in Scripture with sometimes what we hear. Um, uh, when, when we hear people talk about, you know, how God showers us with blessings. He, he does shower us with blessings. Let's not forget that. But, um, but let's not think that, like, there also isn't trial, and there also isn't difficulty, and there also isn't struggle involved with that. Um, and, and part of the blessing is not necessarily a good life, but it's a, it's a well-lived life where at the end we can, like, we look at Jesus, and Jesus looks at us, and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You know? Um, I think he would have said that to John the Baptist. Yeah? Um, so I hope he could say that about us. Here's the other thing I will say um, is that Herod here, um, we have to check our own hearts because we can become a lot like Herod. Um, not in the sense that like we you know, will behead someone, but in the sense that like a lot of times we will say yes to things that we really don't want to say yes to. Um, what I mean by that is Herod doesn't have enough wisdom to know I shouldn't open my mouth and promise something that I'm not going to actually want to fulfill before I know what it is. That's what happens here. What happens here is he, he isn't smart enough to be slow to speak. And he opens up his mouth and says, I'll give you whatever you ask. And then when what they ask for actually is gut-wrenching and sorrowful, 
he has to do it, or at least he feels like he has to do it in order to be an honorable person, right? And this is why Jesus says in, in the Sermon on the Mount, just let your yes be yes and your no be no. You don't need to like try and make it sound better than it really is or stronger. Than, he goes in here and he uses this phrase. He says, I'll give you up to half of my kingdom. He's trying to make it some elaborate promise, right? And, and he's saying, like, you, just, you don't need to do that. Just, just make your yes, yes, and your no, no. Don't make oaths. Don't make oaths because it, it'll, it'll potentially end up bad for you. Um, the, 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 the idea here, I think, that I really resonate with is that there are many times where I've said yes to something without thinking about it really well. Without, not, without pausing and really thinking, is this something I really am going to want to follow through with to the very end? But, and, and I get about two weeks in, and maybe you guys are the same way, but you get about two weeks in, and you're like, ah, I don't want to do this anymore, right? As when, I, I didn't, I didn't, when I said yes to this, ah, I, don't want to, I don't want to be, I don't want to have to say yes, keep saying yes to this, right? Anyone else get this, right? Feel this way? Yeah, resonate with that? So let's be careful before we just jump in and open our mouths and commit ourselves to something that we may not really want to be committed to. Let us have enough wisdom to seek God for discernment to know what we should say yes to and when we should say yes to it uh, so that we can stay committed to it through the long haul. I think that's a really important thing. Here's another thing that I think is uh, maybe more distinctly true of Christians, and I can say this of Christians even though this is not uh, about a Christian, I think Christians do this in some ways that um, are really um, just not, uh, again, go back, go back to what Jesus says on the sermon. I don't think it's helpful. Um, and that's when we use God's name as a justification for our behavior or our actions. Like when we come out and we go, well, I really feel like God was calling me to do this. Or God was leading me in this direction. Or God was telling me to do or go or whatever. Here's, here, here's, the, here's the thing. I truly believe God does speak, God does move, God does lead, okay? He calls us in certain directions. The problem that I have is that so many Christians use that like same phrase five times a week. And they haven't stopped for long enough to actually know what God is calling them to. And so, so we use that as some sort of like religious like backing to make people think like, oh, well, if God says. When really we're chasing after our own desire and our own will. And you can tell that you're chasing after your own desire and your own will when it doesn't work out. And you want to go, oh, well, maybe God didn't say Maybe that was just me all along. I've done this, okay? I've made this mistake. And so just that, that's like we talk about our kids, we, our kids, uh, we, you know, using God's name in vain. Anybody else ever do this with your kids? Yeah. That's the same thing. And we do it all the time. We use God's name as a justification for us to do what we want to do. And, and, and I, think it's, I think it's interesting when I, when I talk to Christians, I've, I've had conversations with Christians who do that, and uh, they, they um, what they're doing and what they're saying, God called me to do this, or God led me in this direction. It's like, that doesn't, like what they, literally what they are doing goes against what God has written in the scriptures. And it's like, he's not going to go against his word, y'all. Like, and so you, you, we, we have a problem in our culture of where we're good enough Christians to have a relationship with God to be able to use his name when we want to use it or when it works out conveniently for us. But we don't have a good enough relationship with Jesus to actually know what his word says and to know that he would never say that. 
Make sense? So let's just be careful. Uh, the other thing is, is that I think that there's a time and a place, and this is the last thing I'll say about this. There's a time and a place where when, um, <laughs> when Herod um, is given an opportunity, I think he believes he's being honorable and honoring his word by doing what he said he would do. Um, but really, he's not honoring his word. He's just trying to protect his reputation. So even in honoring his word, he's just being self-serving so that people don't talk badly about him. He has no spine. He has no ability to admit that he made a mistake making that promise. And there are promises that we can make and that we do make in haste. And when we do that, it is okay for us to look at someone and go, you know what? I made a mistake. I shouldn't have committed to that. I shouldn't have said yes to that. And I would really, I really hate to not come through on my word, but I should have never given you my word, and I'm sorry. Please forgive me for that. I'll try not to do that again in the future, but there's nothing wrong with standing up and going, I made a mistake, and we need to do this more. Stop worrying about our reputation more than we're worried about just saying, you know what? I see now I shouldn't have said yes to this. I shouldn't have said yes. I shouldn't have given um, or gone this far. And um, I need to backtrack a little bit. That happens. We're humans. We make those mistakes. But the more slow to speak we are, probably the less that happens, the less backtracking we have to do. But there are times where it's okay if you say something, just go, you know what? I just can't. I need, to, I, need to, I need to actually stand up because the right thing for me to do here is not to honor my word, but the right thing to do is actually to say, I'm sorry, but I can't honor my word. That's actually a more honorable thing to do. So, all right, let's keep reading, all right? Verse 30. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. Can you picture this? You got these 12 guys running up to Jesus like, Jesus, you know that sermon you gave on the mountain? We taught that sermon and people were amazed, right? They're like, Jesus, do you know those demon-possessed people that you healed? And like, cast the demon, like, we had a demon-possessed guy come up to us and we we're like, in the name of Jesus, get out of here, homie. And they got out. I mean, he, they were so excited, and they were so on fire, man. They were just, oh, man, they are, they are on, a, on a spiritual high. They're doing amazing work. They're so excited. And in verse 31, Jesus said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure to even eat. Whew. Man, they're all excited, and they're enamored with everything that's happening, and everything's going on, and they're running 100 miles an hour, uh, and, and like their hair's on fire, and they love every minute of it. It's incredible, and there's something in Jesus that he notices, and he says, but that's, we're, we're human beings, guys. And we have limits. And we can only run like this for so long before we lose what's most important, and that's our soul. So he invites them. He gives them an invitation. He says, come away with me to a desolate place, and let's rest a while. You guys ever been so busy that you can't even really find time to eat? I know that you have because I have, and I only work once a week, right? So, <laughs> so this past Tuesday, Mallory, my wife, if you guys don't know her, she's amazing. Um, she came to work uh, early Tuesday morning, worked all day, went and picked up the kids from school, like all of you probably, or many of you, um, 
and uh, then she drops the kids off back at the church with me, and I take them home um, and get them dinner. Uh, she goes to softball practice. She coaches softball at the local middle school here, and so she goes to softball practice, and then after softball practice, uh, I'm, I'm feeding our kids, getting our kids dinner because my daughter, Caden, has a travel ball softball practice that same night, and so uh, she... Uh, runs in the house for about three minutes and says, Caden, you ready to go? Okay, awesome, let's go. And, uh, and I was so stupid. I'm like the worst husband ever. You guys are, but, but I was like, literally, like as she's standing there, like, I, like something goes through my head of like, oh man, I should have made her dinner. Anyone else? You wanna like hit me in the face right now? She hadn't eaten all day. All day she hadn't eaten. And she goes, no, I'll be fine. She runs out the house, goes to practice, comes home at like 8.30, pops a bag of popcorn, goes and takes a shower, and then eats it while, you know, binge-watching Netflix or something. I don't know. But um, I was just like, man, like, we get that way sometimes. So busy, we don't even have time to eat. And, um, and that's like, that's, that's what was happening here. Just running so fast. They didn't even have time to stop and eat and take care of themselves. And, um, and if you, anytime you're doing work for the Lord, guys, I'm telling you right now, anytime you do work for the Lord, you, you are no earthly good to anyone else if you're no earthly good to yourself. If you run yourself into the ground, you will not be able to help anyone. And, and that's something that Jesus is trying to teach these disciples. And, um, and so anyway, they, uh, they, they go away with Jesus to get some rest. Uh, verse 32 says, and they went away by boat to a desolate place by themselves. And I wish that's where the story stopped. I wish it was like, all right, we're done there. Uh, and they, got, they were able to get the rest that they wanted and that they needed and that they desired so much. But verse 33 says, Now many saw them going and recognized them and ran. Ran. Guys, I don't know about, how many of y'all ran here today? I know. I like beg people to come to church. I, no one's running to hear my sermons, okay? Like, well, what is, Jesus is like a different dude, man. Like they're running, running by foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. They are faster on foot than the disciples were on the boat. Like, <laughs> I mean, they were booking it, bro. Like, sign them up for the Olympics. Let's go, you know. They get there, and when, they, and when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. He sees these people chasing after him and he realizes they don't have anybody to follow or to teach them or to lead them or to help them. They don't have anybody. All they have is me. And so it says that when he when he saw them, he had compassion on them, and he began to teach them many things. So he sees them, and this is not his plan, right? We know what his plan is. His plan is, I'm going to go with my disciples, and we're going to get away. We're going to get away from all this hustle and bustle into a desolate place where no one is and just rest. And I'll just tell you, um, I, I didn't say this before, and I need to come back to it because I think it's really important. Um, in the busiest seasons is when you need to rest. A lot of us, we get so busy and we go, you know what, I'm too busy. I'm too busy right now. I'll take a rest when I, when I can, right? Um, like I've heard people use the phrase, I'll sleep when I'm dead. That's the worst phrase on the planet. Um, but but here's, the, here's the thing. It's in the, actually the busiest season when we need to put up a boundary and say, you know what, no, I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna get some rest. I'm gonna stop and I'm going to get some rest. It's not when things slow down. It's when things are the busiest. Because you don't know when it's going to slow down. You need to force yourself to take a rest. I would encourage every single person, if you can, to take a three-day personal retreat every year. 
Every year, just you and Jesus and your Bible and a journal get out away from everyone else into a desolate place and just spend some time with God for three days. I guarantee you three days devoted to God uh, in the quiet where you're just reading his word and listening to his voice is going to do you so much more than 52 Sundays sitting here listening to me. Three days will do so much more. But if you can't do three days, maybe you can just do once, like one day a month. Or maybe you can do like, oh, you know what? I'll just do... I'll just do one day in a really busy season. Like maybe you're in a really busy season right now. Take a sick day. Take a PTO day. Spend that day with Jesus. Do something to slow down and get away with him. That's their plan, right? Their plan is we're going to be intentional about taking some time to get away. And then these people show up, and they're sheep, they're sheep without a shepherd. They have no one to lead them, no one to help them, no one to, uh, to teach them. And so Jesus has compassion on them. He begins to teach them. He's interrupted in what he wants to do and where he is planning to go. The... Um, on your way out today, you're going to get some cards. You're going to get like a stack of five cards that are rubber banded together. And they just have uh, acts of kindness really on them. But here's what we really want them. We don't want them to be uh, simple acts of kindness. We want them to be simple acts of inconvenience. <laughs> because we want you to be interrupted and inconvenienced on where you're going and the journey that you're on to help someone else because that's what Jesus does. Jesus is on a journey. He has a plan. These people interrupt him and inconvenience him. And he stops and he has compassion and kindness and love toward them. And we want to encourage you. That's something that we can all do, right? It's so hard when our kids run in and we're in the middle of something, but we can be inconvenienced. We can be interrupted. It's so hard when our parents are aging and they get sick and we have to stop what we're doing to go take care of them. But when we do, we look more like Jesus. It's hard when you know, we're trying to get some rest on a Saturday because we've had a really busy week. And someone calls us and says, hey, man, you know, my wife left last night. To sit there and be with that person in the midst of that. Or, oh, man, I'm, I'm, I was in a car accident. Can you come pick me up or come help me or whatever the case might be, right? Whatever it might be. There are times where, man, like the inconveniences or the interruptions can just be frustrating. And I think what we see here in Jesus is like he was never frustrated by an interruption. He saw it as an opportunity to show compassion and love and care to the people who needed it. And that's a really powerful thing that can help us become more like him if we can do that too. Verse 35, it says, And when it grew late, his disciples said to him, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away into the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. <laughs> and they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? So, the disciples, they show up to Jesus and they're like, hey, um, we had plans for this trip. <laughs> um, we have everything worked out, but these people don't have anything to eat. And Jesus goes, well, feed them. <laughs> it's so interesting to me that I think they had, at the beginning of the story, they're talking about all that they had done, all the miracles they had performed, all the things they had taught. And then they get to a situation that seems too big for them and they no longer have faith. We are so much like that. 
We can see God do amazing things one day, and then the next day our faith is gone. He says, uh, they, they, they go, you want us to go buy them bread? Is that what you're telling us? 200 denarii. Um, in case you're wondering, 200 denarii, uh, a denarii was uh, one day's wages uh, back in that time. So 200 denarii would have been the equivalent of $25,000 today on bread. They're like, hey, you want us to go spend $25,000 on bread? Like, we're not even going to have meat. <laughs> Just 25K? Really? All right, Jesus. You know, like, maybe Jesus had all that money, you know? He's the you know, landowner with a thousand cattle or whatever. Um, but it's just so, it's so funny to me. It's just they, they just can't. They can't fathom. And Jesus says, well, how many loaves do you have? Go see. And when they had found out, they said, we have five and two fish. And then he commanded them all to sit down in, group, in groups on the green grass. Do you guys ever say like, to your people, like, sit on the green grass? Like, don't sit on the grass. Sit on the green grass, please. You know? No, we keep people off the green grass, okay, y'all? We, it's, like, we're like, hey, our grass is green. We'd like to stay that way. Please walk on the sidewalk. You know, like stay off the green grass. Uh, it's like, I don't know why green is in there. I don't, I don't understand. Like, I, I'm like reading this and I'm like, why does he say green? I don't understand. Like, why did he just say grass? Anyway, weird people. Okay, uh, so verse 40. So they sat down in groups of 50, uh, hundreds and fifties and taking five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and he said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave it to them to... Uh, his disciples to set before the people and they divided the two fish among them all and they ate and were satisfied and they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish and those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men so way more than 5,000 were there <laughs> and you know we've, we've heard this sermon before like man God is a God of multiplication right like, we give him a little, and he can multiply that into much more. And that's true. Our God is a God of multiplication. He is a God who can take the little that we have, and he can absolutely bring abundance out of that little. I mean, it is absolutely incredible. Um, but let me, let me not mix here uh, metaphors or words because I think it's really important that we see that he takes a little and he blesses others with the little that we brought to offer. It isn't necessarily about bringing a little bit so Jesus can bring more blessing to us. It is about bringing a little bit so Jesus can bring more blessing to the multitudes who are in need. These people need food, and Jesus takes the little bit that we have to offer, and he can make a huge difference in people's lives who have a need. This is such a powerful, powerful story um, of just what, what God can do, not for us, but for people who are in need, if we trust him with just a little bit of what we have to offer. And that isn't just our finances. That's maybe all we have is a little bit of time. Or maybe all we have is, you know, a little bit of in this one spot. You know? And he can take that and he can multiply that and it can become a huge blessing to people who need it. I think that's a really, really powerful and beautiful, beautiful, beautiful potential and opportunity that we all have. <clears throat> and I love how Jesus, he looks up when he blesses this meal. How many of us pray with our heads bowed and eyes closed? Yeah. I, I, and I, 
That's great. I do too, I, most of the time. And even when I teach my kids how to pray, I'd say, bow your head and close your eyes. You know. And, um, but I love the fact that Jesus looked up to heaven because heaven is where bread comes from. Jesus remembers the story of the Exodus and them wandering through the wilderness with no food and wandering through this desolate place with no food and, and God rains down bread from heaven and he gives them more than enough. And so where does Jesus look whenever he needs help? He looks up. And maybe you're in a situation where, man, God, I need you to help me. I need you to come through. I need you to rain bread from heaven. Look up. Raise your prayers up to the sky. Raise your face and look up and see just the blessings and the gifts that the Father rains down. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. And so... I think, yeah, like pray head bowed and eyes closed in reverence of who God is and just the fact that he is worthy of glory and honor and he is more powerful and more beautiful than we could ever imagine. But also, like sometimes when you really maybe are like, man, really asking, God, do something great here in my life. Do something right now that I need to do. I need you to come through. Look up. Look up. Pray that prayer. Ask him to rain down that bread from heaven. Because that's, that's where the good gifts come from. Um, I, love, um, I love the fact that so, so much of Jesus' ministry happens around meals. And, uh, you know, Jesus instituted a meal uh, much later. And this is a great miracle, you know. But he institutes another meal that it symbol, it's a symbol of a greatest miracle he ever performed, which is that he allowed his body to be broken, his blood to be shed so that we could have eternal life. And he raised from the dead, conquering death. Because you and I were sheep without a shepherd. We were lost, wandering, needing someone to come and show us the way. And so Jesus dies so that we can be united to him, have a relationship with him, and he can, he can lead us, and we can walk with him, and he can be our shepherd. And he can lead us beside still waters. And he can restore our soul. That he can guide us and protect us through the valley of the shadow of death. That his rod and his staff can bring us comfort. that he can prepare a table for us in the presence of our enemy and the enemy can't take a seat that is our good shepherd and that is what Jesus does when he when he dies on the cross and allows his body to be broken his blood shed so that we can have life and so it is this meal that we celebrate it's this meal that we come to each week because we remember that we were once sheep without a shepherd. But now we have a good shepherd in Christ who leads us and guides us and protects us and loves us and has compassion on us and saves us. And so today as we come to the table, I'd encourage you just to maybe reflect on that, find hope in that, and, uh, and listen. Listen for the voice of your shepherd so that you can do um, whatever it is he calls you to do. Go wherever it is he calls you to go. Maybe that's t to, a, to a place of rest. Maybe that's to a place of reaching more people with the gospel. Maybe, maybe that's to more faith, to just believe that he can provide when you have very little to offer. Whatever it is, just uh, know he is with you. Let's pray. 
God, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your grace. God, we thank you for your love and your kindness. And um, we thank you that you allowed yourself to be inconvenienced. To be mutilated and broken before us. To be murdered and despised, rejected for us, your sheep who were without a shepherd. Thank you for seeing us and knowing what we needed and offering it to us. God, you are so good, so good. We come and we bow before you now. We thank you that we are now a part of a flock. And we can now hear your voice and talk to you and walk with you each day. We praise you, thank you, love you, and pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.